Well, there were a couple of things that happened this week that seem worth talking about. One of them, of course, was that yesterday Martha Stewart was sentenced to 10 months imprisonment, five in a real-life prison and five in her home. And you have to figure that anybody who was sentenced to even to 10 months detention of any kind must have had a lot of victims that testified against her in her trial. There must have been quite a parade of people coming forward and talking about the money they were built out of by her nefarious activities. What's that you say? There were no victims testifying at the trial? Hmm. You mean this was a victimless crime? Well, I guess it was. Actually, they didn't even charge her with insider trading. They charged her with lying about insider trading. As I've said before, this was not a crime against people. This was a crime against the state. And I did get an email a little while ago from someone who had just recently read one of my articles and let me interrupt myself to say that on the Radio Links page tonight, I have two articles that I wrote some time ago about the Martha Stewart case. One of them goes into great detail about insider trading, pointing out that there is no crime against, or let me back up and say that there should not be any crime on the books about insider trading, and in fact, there really isn't, and that insider trading does not hurt anybody else. And then the other one talks about the ramifications of this and the fact that the rule of law is being destroyed in this country step by step by step as prosecutors just make cases out of thin air and they will make up things like obstructing justice or something else in order to get the people that they want to get. But in any event, somebody emailed me this evening and said, I agree with you that almost all of the stockholders were destined to lose money after the negative announcement was made regarding the Enclome stock that Martha Stewart supposedly sold on the basis of insider trading. So it didn't really matter what Martha Stewart did. These people were going to lose money anyway. And in that respect, it can reasonably be said to be a victimless crime. And the writer of this email goes on to say, quote, I believe, however, that the actual victim of her stock trade was the person or, or persons who bought the stock that she sold with the help of her inside information. It seems logical to me that the person wanting to buy M clone stock that was tendered by Stewart would most certainly have backed away from the transaction had he known what Stewart knew from an insider. The purchase, person who purchased her stock has to be considered a victim, since he had no way to determine on his own or through paid research what was about to happen with the price of the stock and why. Had he been somehow able to determine about the pending fall in price and the reason behind it, then he also would have been the recipient of inside information and we would find ourselves going around in circles. Well, that's all very well and good, but the fact of the matter is that he wanted to buy the stock. And what would have happened if Martha Stewart had not used her inside information, if she really had any, and we, that was never proven, but suppose Martha Stewart had not sold her stock, then what would have happened to the individual who wound up buying that stock or buying at the very time that she sold? Well, that individual would have paid a higher price for the stock. Martha Stewart not selling or selling on the basis of whatever reason she had is not going to affect whether or not somebody else buys but it is going to have an effect upon the price that somebody else pays, and that price is going to be higher if Martha Stewart does not enter the competition among sellers in order to get that transaction with the person who wants to buy the stock. So she actually did a favor to the person who bought her stock. If she had not been in the market, that person would have paid a higher price. It wouldn't have been much higher, but the fact is that it wouldn't have been lower. She did not hurt anybody by selling her stock, whether or not she did it on inside information. But, of course... The government, not wanting to try to, to prosecute her on the basis of insider information, decided instead that they were going to prosecute her on the basis of lying. And the prosecutor made it clear that there were two kinds of lies involved. One is that Martha Stewart lied when she said she was innocent, and that lying was used to try to prop up the stock of her own company. This is really creating a prosecution out of thin air. It means that any time you're accused of a crime, if you claim innocence, then the government can act, add to its prosecution, whatever that prosecution was, they can add an additional charge of lying. And if it turns out that you are convicted of this other thing, then you will be, in addition, convicted of lying about your guilt. And this is just absolutely ridiculous. You might as well say that no attorney ought to be entitled to go into court and claim that his client is innocent, because that might turn out to be untrue. And if it is, well, let's throw the attorney in prison. It makes no sense whatsoever. But even if Martha Stewart lied, and we don't know that she did, and even if she, she actually did act on insider trading information, so-called, and even if she lied about her innocence, and again, we don't know any of this stuff because none of it was really proven in court. It was simply a case of he said, she said. But even if she did lie, her lies were trivial to the lies that are told day after day after day by government prosecutors. And the consequences of her lie are just absolutely infinitesimally small compared to the consequences of the lies of government employees, government prosecutors, government policemen, people in the government who lie because they have immunity. 
And on my website tonight, I have put and uh, linked to an example of one of those lies. It is the story of Lonnie Lundy. Lonnie Lundy was a businessman in Alabama. He had never smoked, never drunk, never done drugs in his entire life. He had a business, and he had it among his employees an individual who did drugs. And that individual occasionally sold drugs in order to support his habit, in addition to working for Lonnie Lundy. The police caught that individual, hauled him in, and decided that they wanted to prosecute Lonnie Lundy. They lied to this employee and told him that Lonnie Lundy was now in custody, and they told him that there was going to be a life sentence either for him or for Lonnie Lundy, and it was up to him to decide whether it would be him or Lonnie Lundy. This poor individual, faced with this Hobson's choice, obviously chose to let Lonnie Lundy go to prison, and they said that uh, if he, he didn't, first of all, confess before Lonnie Lundy did, then Lundy was going to roll on him, and he was gonna, the employee would wind up with life in prison. The individual then finally gave in, and he confessed. He went to court, and uh, having been told that his sentence would be cut to five years, the judge asked him if he knew what he was doing if the, and if the prosecution had made any deals with him. And on orders from the prosecution, he said, no, there were no deals. I know what I'm doing. I'm telling the truth. The prosecutor in, in the testimony again asked him, did anybody promise you anything as a result of you, your testimony? Are you getting any reward for this? And again, he said no. And then he found out after the trial that Lundy had never in any way, shape, or form, said that he was going to testify against the, the employee. And Lonnie Lundy wound up in prison with a term of life and no possibility whatsoever of parole. This man still languishes in prison today because of the lies that were told to the employee by the prosecutors. And when the employee found out about this, he went back into court and he told the judge that he had lied. And the judge said, well, I don't think you were lying when you testified before. I think you're lying now, so get out of here. The employee asked the prosecutors why they were after Lundy, and the prosecutor admitted to him, acknowledged to him, that the reason for it was because they were convicting too many black people and that they needed a prominent white person in order to balance their uh, their conviction record. Now, this whole thing is in an interview that was on PBS's Frontline, and the transcript of the interview is on the web, and I have linked to it on the Radio Links page. To get there, you just go to my website, harrybrown.org, and when you do, you will see right at the top of the home page links to articles and websites mentioned on the broadcast. Click there, and you will see the two Martha Stewart articles by me and this transcript of the interview. We're going to be back in just a couple of minutes, and if you have some comments or questions or criticisms about this, let me know, and we'll go on to the other big topic of the week. This is Harry Brown. The other big thing that happened this week, a big thing, I have, it's not really a big thing at all, was that the Republicans in the Senate tried to get a vote on the gay marriage constitutional amendment. They didn't really try very hard to get the vote. All they wanted was to get some kind of a vote taken on closing the debate on it just so that they could get people on record. And 50 senators voted against it, including some Republicans, voted against closing the debate on it so that there would then be a vote on the amendment. You need two-thirds of the senators and two-thirds of the House to vote for something to make it a proposed constitutional amendment, which then has to be ratified by three-quarters of the state legislatures. So it's obvious that there's no chance of this amendment going through. It's just a grandstanding thing because most people, if you ask them in a poll, do you think that gays should be married in the same way as heterosexual people, will say, no, I guess not. And so George Bush, posing as the stout defender of traditional marriage, can one-up on jo John Kerry, who will not pose in the same way. He'll pose on something else instead. And I put a couple of links on the Radio Links page because there were so many dumb things that have been said about this. I, one of those links is to an article that was on a conservative site about how gay marriage has destroyed traditional marriage in Scandinavian countries. And all this talk about traditional marriage and that people say that they're traditionalists, well, if they're traditionalists, then they must be opposed to interracial marriage also because the tradition was that blacks and whites were not allowed to marry in this country in practically any state in the Union until just the last 50 years or so. And, of course, tradition, actually, if you go beyond marriage, there are a lot of traditions, things like slavery which was the tradition in this country at the time of the founding of the country, uh, that slavery existed not just in the South, but throughout uh, the northern states as well. And so, obviously, tradition is not the issue here. The question is, do you want a constitutional amendment to tell the states that they cannot legalize gay marriage? Now, the interesting thing about it is that the amendment says, Marriage in the United States shall consist only of the union of a man and a woman. Neither this Constitution nor the Constitution of any state shall be construed to require that marriage or the legal incidence thereof be conferred upon any union other than that of a man and a woman. End of.
the proposed amendment. The Constitution is a limitation upon government, not a limitation upon the people. The Constitution was created in order to define exactly what powers the government had and to make it absolutely clear that the government had no additional powers. I have not uh, taken the time in the last day or so to look through all the constitutional amendments to make absolutely sure of this, but I'm reasonably sure that there have been only two amendments passed in the history of the country which were designed to give the government more power than it had before. All the other amendments have been designed to emphasize the restriction on government power. And the two times that the Constitution has been amended to increase the government's power were, number one, to give it the power to tax incomes, which it did not have in the original Constitution. The original Constitution prohibited any kind of a direct tax unless it was in proportion to the census, meaning that it had to be an equal tax upon everybody in the country rather than a variable tax where you could tax one person $100 and somebody else $1,000 by taxing their income. And the 16th Amendment removed that restriction so that the government now had the power, in effect, to tax incomes. The other incident was the Prohibition Amendment. And that amendment was so disastrous that it had to be repealed. This proposed constitutional amendment about marriage as being defined as only between a man and a woman is another attempt of the government, uh, of the politicians, to expand the power of government to limit action by individuals, cities, or states in the country. And I can almost guarantee that it would be doomed to create as much of a disaster as the income tax amendment and the prohibition amendments did. Well, not... No, I shouldn't say that. That's overstating the case. But it will be just as much a disaster. It's just that the ramifications will not be as disastrous as the other two would be. We have come so far from the concept of constitutional government in this country that anybody can get up on the floor of the House or the Senate and propose almost any ridiculous, absurd thing and not be laughed out of the chamber whether it is to do something about steroids in Major League Baseball or to tell you whom you can hire for your business or what the interest rate must be, it's not out of the province of government. There is no limitation on government. And Dave in Minnesota says, haven't we already abandoned traditional marriage by no longer having arranged marriages? Isn't letting people choose their own spouses without parental direction an attack on traditional marriage? What about the old tradition of using marriages between nobles from two different countries to cement political alliances? If Bush is such a defender of traditional marriage, why hasn't he had one of his daughters marry Tony Blair to safeguard America's alliance with the U.K.? Very well put, Dave. This whole idea of tradition is ridiculous, obviously. The whole thing is ridiculous. It is simply pandering to a certain element in the population. And Bush needs to do that because conservatives, many, many, many conservatives in this country are very, very upset with the Bush administration's activities of the last three and a half years. The tremendous government spending, the fact that he has not vetoed a single bill, no matter how ridiculous, coming out of Congress, no matter how expensive, no matter how intrusive coming out of Congress, Bush will not veto a bill. And uh, even a lot of conservatives who have now come to decide that the Iraqi war was pure invention and should never have been prosecuted. And so... Uh, as a result, he's got to find a way to shore up his so-called base, and one way to do that is by harping on the social issues, and gay marriage is a, a ready target. Well, let's see what's going on out in the USA, and let's begin by talking to Paul in Virginia. Good evening, Paul. Good evening. How are you doing? Uh, just fine. What's up? Uh, I uh, just want to make a comment about on the uh, Martha's story, which, you know, I think, uh, you know, for that, you know, go to prison, you know, say it's a victimless crime. And uh, I kind of <laughs> been in that situation uh uh, like that, I'm in the late forties, but back when I was like twenty years old, uh I was with a guy that that uh did sell some a small amount of marijuana to an undercover agent. And uh that was like in seventy eight and then in nineteen eighty they came and charged me with a felony for that. And told me the only way to pardon me, before you go on, they charged you for the same incident or this was a, a completely different incident from when your roommate was charged or your friend? Uh it was the same incident. Uh, but they but they came to you years later. Two years later. Well but it was I, I was with it. And he, he, he sold the pot. I mean, you know, he did. But then, uh, I guess, you know, uh, I don't know what the situation was with him. Anyway, they came to me and said that if I didn't go to work with him and, and, and set up other people, that they was going to charge me with what he did, which they ended up doing that because I wouldn't do it. And I'd never been in any trouble. I was only, you know, in high school a couple of years and everything. Well, uh, I ended up doing five years in the Virginia State Penitentiary. Oh, my heavens. <laughs> over that. And, uh, which, you know, because like I say, I said, look, you know, I didn't do it. And, uh, when I went to court, the judge said, well, you know, you're not going to say you were sorry and all this and everything. And I sent you to five years in prison, which, like I said, I did my time. But, uh, you know, I didn't, I didn't bow upon him, you know. And I was always, you know, going up the type of person, you know, I believed in, you know, the flag and everything and stuff like that, you know, the big, the big vice, so to speak, you know, that we're living a free country. But now, that was only beginning. <laughs> in 1997, 
uh, I had, uh, uh, had a construction accident in 1992, and uh, uh, I was uh, doing work workman's comp because I was out of work anyway. The workman's comp uh, cut my money out, and I got a speed ticket. It was like 62 and a 55. Well, I was unable to pay that, but in the process, I was trying to get back to work. So, so you know, I did drive on a suspended license, waiting to pay a $39 fine. Well, uh, matter of fact, I got called twice, but it was only for you to pay the same fine of $39. Well, uh, it was like uh, in 97, early 97, this policeman said that he saw me driving uh, two weeks prior to that and came and arrested me and took me to jail, which I wasn't driving because I was working. I know where I was at. Anyway, just you know, two weeks later, he said, anyway, they declared me an official offender. Now, I have never had a wreck. I never had a D or anything. I don't drink or anything like that. No, uh, other than the speed tickets, you know, I've never had any kind of problem at all with my driving. Well, they declared me an official offender, and they gave me 16 months within the state penitentiary. Wow. And so you served that? I served that. Well, now, okay. okay. Now, in 2002, uh, I have a real bad problem with breathing and everything, right? Okay. And they declared me a official offender and took my license for 10 years. That's after I did the 16 months and paid $2,000 a month. Okay. In uh, April of 2002, I was at my house, and I had an asthma attack, and I had real severe asthma, and I owned a business, which was about a mile from my house. And uh, so... I had a choice of dying because I couldn't breathe. I didn't have my medications. I left the store. and uh, So you had to I, drive to get there. I drove to get there. Well, uh, I got caught driving uh, with this uh, policeman about 25 foot from my store. Well, I explained the situation to him and everything, right? Yeah, that's so, a lot of good. So, <laughs> and so he said, well, he said, uh, you know, well, you probably just get probation now. I said, well, you know, I said, I got this business. And I said, you know, I'm going to lose everything I got. You know, can you give me a break? Well, he wouldn't do that. You know, but that's cool. You know, he didn't give me a break. Well, I go to court on that. Well, they do. Instead of... Uh, uh, going by my medical information and stuff like that, like I say, you know, I wasn't, you know, I, I was mm-hmm. right there at the store pretty much. So what was the uh, sentence? So I did, uh, they gave me 14 months in prison and, uh, one year's probation, which I've got two months probation left. And I paid out, now check this out. <laughs> I paid out about $4,000 of fine and stuff. So I go to DMV, my record's clean with DMV. And so DMV tells me in order to get a license restored, uh, I need to go in front of the judge and, uh, have him, uh, send them paperwork saying he restored my license. So I go hire an attorney, which cost me 500 bucks. And then uh, I go to the attorney. Well, uh, they send me to ASAP. I'll call Safety Action Program, right? Okay, I have no DUIs or no records. I was no records. I'm on my record. So I go to ASAP, pay them 150 bucks. They send me to the hospital to take a drug test, which I passed the drug test and everything like that. And then I go in front of the judge, and instead of him going by the law, it says once the fine and everything was paid, my license will be restored. Instead of him going by the law, he goes by that recommendation to ASAP, who charged me 150 bucks and thirty dollars for the drug test. Now they will go said by their guidelines, I should not be able to get a driver's license for another five years. Oh, well, swell. <laughs> Let's go back to the, the the first incident. Your friend sold drugs or bought drugs from an he under. Sold, he sold. A, I have out the pot on him cover agent. Yeah, right, and the under and the undercover agent posed as a drug dealer. Was that what well, happened? The, under, he, the undercover. He posed as a drug user. I see, and yeah. told him he told your friend that he wanted to buy drugs for for himself. Yeah, yeah. So the undercover agent lied, in effect. They lied, yeah. in effect. Yeah. Right. So he's going to go to the undercover agent's going to go to prison for ten months for lying, like Martha Stewart is, I guess. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Good. Okay. <laughs> good. Good luck to you, Paul. I hope things improve. Oh, uh, like I say, I'm not going back to prison no more. I mean, you know, I'm not going to criminal myself on the I'm not going ever back to prison. You know. Uh, get yourself a scooter in case you have to get someplace in a hurry. <laughs> oh, <laughs> I don't have to do that. If I can call right a lawnmower, it's five years in prison. Oh my God. All right. Well, good <laughs> anyway, luck. I, I, that'd be interesting. Yeah, it is. Good hey, luck. And uh, by the way, I really love your show. I only get an hour of it. But, oh, uh, well, call I your only, call your I, station and tell them. Oh, I'm going to, but I, you know, I don't even quit. I used to listen to all the other talk shows and stuff like that, but just, you know, with this Democrat against the Republican stuff like that. And, uh, I didn't know that much about the Libertarian Party, but I really, uh, I'm a Libertarian. I feel like my heart. And, uh, I really enjoy your program. I really do. Like I said, you don't want a guy to listen to anymore because you don't want to make any sense to me. <laughs> well, thank you very much. I appreciate that. And I appreciate your call. Uh, I appreciate your time. And, and, and take care of yourself. Thank you. To you okay. Uh, we have an email from Dan who talking about what I said about the fact that only two amendments that I could think of offhand that actually increased the power of the government. He says, in addition to the 16th and 18th Amendments, the 17th also gave more power to the federal government because it altered the balance of power between the federal government and the states. And for those not familiar with it, the original Constitution said that the members of the House of Representatives would be elected by the people in their districts. The senators were not elected by the people but were appointed by the state legislatures. In other words, the state of Ohio took it would take a vote in the legislature to decide who each of the two senators would be and the 17th amendment which was passed in 1913 the same year as the income tax amendment changed that and provided for direct election of the senators the same as with the house of representatives and what difference does that make well the difference is 
that when the senators were appointed by the state legislatures, if they were to, in the Senate, then vote for increased federal power at the expense of the states, they would get fired by the state legislatures. They'd never get reappointed for the next six-year term. And so it was part of the check and balance system that the House of Representatives would be voted in by the people themselves, while the the U.S. senators would be voted in by the state legislatures. And that would keep us from having the situation where both houses would be appealing directly to the people and pandering to them by trying to vote them largest out of the treasury or enlarging federal power and taking power away from the states and localities and so on. And uh, so it did change the balance of power, but I didn't mention it before because it was not directly an increase in federal power. It was just a change in the uh, check and balance system, which resulted in increased federal power and is in its own way as insidious as the 16th Amendment is. I've said several times on this show that if the 16th Amendment, the income tax amendment, hadn't been passed, we probably never would have gotten into World War One. And if the United States had stayed out of World War One, there probably never would have been a World War II, and there might not have even ever been a communist empire in the Soviet Union, simply because it was the U.S. entering World War I that made it possible for the communists to come to power in Russia and also created the conditions by which the British and French were able to impose such drastic, oppressive conditions on the Germans at the end of the war that it gave rise to Hitler just 14 years later. And so the point is that these things are not just technicalities. They have very, very direct ramifications, and the 17th Amendment has had ramifications. We see it in the posturing and pandering in the Senate just this last week on this gay marriage thing. I don't believe that there is any way in the world, if the U.S. senators were still appointed by the state legislatures, that there would have been this debate in the Senate over the defense of marriage amendment because the states would not have wanted to give up the power to make this decision for themselves in the traditional American way. also have an email from David in Sydney, Australia says, I was talking with some friends of mine over here, and we started wondering what sort of message Bush has sent to the evildoers in this world when he attacked Iraq. By only attacking those who cannot defend themselves and who are not a threat to the U.S., as was the case with Iraq and Afghanistan not being threats, and resorting to diplomacy when it comes to those with nuclear arms and are a threat, it seems to us that the message he is sending to every two-bit dictator in the world who desperately wants to grasp onto power is I'd better build up my nuclear capabilities and threaten the U.S., otherwise they'll come and run me over. He makes a very, very good point here, and that is that the Bush administration has gone over and beaten up people in Afghanistan and Iraq, killed an awful lot of people. We hear about the hundreds of Americans who have died in Iraq, but we don't hear about the tens of thousands of Iraqis who have died there, and they're not all members of the Republican Guard. There are people who have been blown up by American missiles. There are people who have been shot at checkpoints because they couldn't understand English. There are people who have just simply been killed by being in the line of fire and by trigger-happy soldiers who are scared to death of the local population and understandably scared to death of the local population. And the same thing has happened in Afghanistan. But the Bush administration has not gone after Pakistan, which has nuclear weapons and is run by a dictator who long ago declared martial law and suspended elections there and who may be in his own way just as much an evil dictator as Saddam Hussein. And George Bush made a great deal about North Korea being the part of uh, being one of the elements of the axis of evil, but it has done nothing to go over there and to kick people in the behind to try to do something to stop their nuclear program. And it all comes back to the fact that the United States simply does not attack countries that can fight back. For 50 years, almost, it waged a Cold War against the Soviet Union, but you notice it never attacked the Soviet Union. It never attacked the communist China government. It never attacked any country that had the weapons to cause problems for the United States. But it did invade Grenada. It did invade Panama. It did bomb Libya. It did all of these other things uh, of similar nature. It overthrew the democratic government of Iran in 1953. It installed dictators in the Dominican Republic and then removed them. It installed dictators in Haiti and then removed them. And on and on and on. There's a long, long list of these interventions by the United States, but never against anybody who could fight back. And this is not a slur upon America. It is a slur upon the people who have been running America for the last 100 years or so. Dave also points out, why did Bush believe Gaddafi so easily when Gaddafi said he was going to tear up his nuclear weapons program? Why did did Bush believe Gaddafi and not Saddam Hussein? For all we know, Libya is lying to the world and is readying an attack. It's a very, very good point. I think the answer to it is that Bush wanted to display Gaddafi as proof that attacking Iraq was a good thing because it threw the fear of God into all the other dictators of the world, and they are all going to roll over and play dead for the United States now as witness what Gaddafi did. And, of course, we don't know 
what Qaddafi did. We don't know that he even had a nuclear weapons program. All we know is what the Bush administration tells us. And what we have been getting from the Bush administration has not been very credible evidence. And I'm not referring just to the uranium from Niger or the weapons of mass destruction or even the links to al-Qaeda. There are so many other things, the aluminum tubes, the mobile laboratories, the unmanned airplanes, the distance that the missiles could travel, and all these other things that Colin Powell told the United Nations that have since proven to be untrue. And enough of all that. Let's go to Tennessee and talk with William. Good evening, William. Uh, hello. Yes, it's a pleasure speaking with you. Uh, I was wondering about the is the, the banking act, federal banking act, is it unconstitutional? Do you mean the Federal Reserve Act? Yes. Well, the Constitution prohibits a national bank because it says that only gold and silver can be used as legal tender, meaning in regard to government affairs. And in order to try to circumvent the Constitution, they made it look like the Federal Reserve System was a private banking organization. And it is funny that there are a lot of conspiracy theory folks who think that the Federal Reserve is actually a private organization masquerading as a government agency, when in fact it is a government agency that's masquerading as a private agency. And it really is not constitutional, but it, it uh, was designed in such a way to appear to be constitutional, and certainly any libertarian president would go to work immediately to try to get rid of it and get us back on a gold standard and get into a situation that we had prior to 1913, whereby all paper money was issued as receipts for gold and silver and was not issued by the federal government. The federal government is not authorized by the Constitution to issue any paper money whatsoever, and that's why they made it look like this was a private agency and that the Federal Reserve, a so-called private agency, is issuing this paper, and people are accepting it. Does that answer the question? Yes, yes. Uh, it was passed in 1913? Yes, it was. It was a very ominous year. That was the year the income tax amendment was passed, and immediately Congress passed the first income tax law as soon as the amendment was ratified. And it was the same year that they changed the election of senators from the legislatures to direct election, and it was the year that the Federal Reserve Act was passed, a lot of it having to do with Woodrow Wilson's activities. I understand. Thanks a lot. Thanks. You bet. Thanks for calling. An email from Eric says, How did the government ever get a military draft in the face of Article 13 or Amendment 13 of the Constitution, which says that neither slavery nor involuntary servitude, except as a punishment for crime whereof the party shall have been duly convicted, shall exist within the United States or any place subject to their jurisdiction? Well, that's a very good question. Conscription is obviously unconstitutional. And in fact, in the First World War, when the draft bill was passed, a number of people went to prison merely for citing the Constitution as making conscription invalid. Uh, the Espionage Act was passed by Congress, and the Espionage Act was used as the weapon to convict anybody who was in any way hindering the war effort. And the focus of a lot of the opposition to war was over conscription and the idea that young men could be drafted against their will and made to send off to Europe to fight uh, for the Army, the Navy, or whatever. And when people stood up and, and complained about conscription, they were accused and convicted of hindering the war effort. And a lot of times, their opposition was based on the Constitution. And there were such things as a guy putting out a pamphlet called Long Live the Constitution, in which he cited the 13th Amendment and said that conscription was obviously unconstitutional and that therefore uh, young men should not be drafted against their will, and the man was sentenced to several years in prison. So it is a terrible situation that this is allowed, and it is amazing that you can say that people who have been conscripted against their will and dragooned, in effect, into the military service are off somewhere fighting for what? Fighting for freedom. People who are virtual slaves are supposedly fighting for freedom. It makes no sense whatsoever. I was one of those slaves for three years. I was drafted into the Army. I will not give the date. It was so long ago. But the fact is that I was drafted, and I did not want to go, and I was dragooned against my will. I had a choice of either going or serving some time in prison, and I decided it was better to serve the time in the Army. But that's the way it is. Another disturbing thing came up in the news this past week. It has been pointed out over the last few months since the problem came up about the prisoners being abused and tortured at the prison in Iraq that some of the people who were running that prison had formerly been running the prisons at Guantanamo and that it raised the suggestion that maybe things were not too kosher at the Guantanamo prison where they were holding these people that had been captured in Afghanistan and in a few other places, some in the United States, and been sent to Guantanamo indefinitely, unable to consult an attorney, unable to face their accusers, unable even to get charged with a crime so that they have their day in court. But for all they know, maybe there for the rest of their lives, because that's how long the war on terrorism is presumed to, that is going to last. Well, some of those people are not Americans, and they are not... Uh, Afghans, and they are not Pakistanis, but in fact are Europeans. And one of them was a Swede, 
who had been in Guantanamo for two and a half years. And when the Swedish president visited George Bush, he pleaded with Bush to let this guy out of prison. And he finally was released this past week. His name is, and I'm sure to mispronounce this, Mehdi Ghazali. And according to a news report from Reuters, he was the son of an Algerian-born immigrant who was arrested in Pakistan. Now, Ghazali says that he was in Pakistan studying Islam, and he immediately was interviewed by the Swedish media as soon as he arrived home this past Wednesday. He says that during the two and a half years he was in prison in Guantanamo, he was tortured by being exposed to freezing cold, noise, bright lights, and he was chained frequently during his two and a half year imprisonment. He says, quote, they put me in the interrogation room and used it as a refrigerator. They set the temperature to minus degrees so it was terribly cold and one had to freeze there for many hours. 12 to 14 hours one had to sit there chained. And he says that he partially lost the feeling in one foot as a result of it. He says that he was deprived of sleep for about two weeks by constant switching of cells and interrogation. He was exposed to powerful flashes of light in a dark room, to very loud music and noise, and was chained for long periods in painful positions. Quote, they forced me down with chained feet. Then they took away the chains from the hands, pulled the arms under the legs, and chained them hard again. I could not move, end of quote. After several hours, his feet were swollen and his whole body was aching. Now, when he was released, there was some coverage of this in the American media. I can't recall offhand where I saw it, probably in the Washington Post online and on CNN online and some other places, just simply saying that the Swede was released through the intervention of the Swedish president and that the Swede had been in prison for two and a half years. But then the Swede got home to Sweden and gave interviews to the Swedish media, and that's where these details came out, where his allegations came out, and I have to realize that they are allegations. There's no independent verification for them. But it is strange that there is has been no coverage in the American press of this, no coverage whatsoever of these allegations, even though they were carried on the Reuters news service. I did a search on the Internet about this, and I came up with oh, dozens and dozens of hits, not about the release, but about the allegations that were made. But all of the hits are for Swedish media, apparently Swedish. I <laughs> don't speak Swedish, but just reading the one or two line description, it appeared to me that this was in the Swedish language. Now, I mention this because it seems to provide further confirmation to the extent that this man can be believed that what was going on in Iraq was also going on and may be continuing to go on in Guantanamo. But there is a further dimension to the story which really needs to be investigated. According to the Reuters report, quote, he said he was visiting a friend in the Afghan town of Jalalabad near the Pakistani border when a U.S. attack started. And so he decided to return to Pakistan when he heard that villagers were selling foreigners to the U.S. forces. But he was captured by Pakistani villagers while crossing the border from Afghanistan, and he was sold to Pakistani police who then turned him over to the U.S. military. He was flown from Pakistan to Afghanistan and arrived in Guantanamo in January of 2002. End of quote of the Reuters dispatch. Now, let's get this straight, what happened here. Pakistani people at the border there were selling Afghans to the Pakistani police for money, and those people were turned over to the United States military. Before we go back to the phones, just a couple of quick points. I want to make sure you understood what I meant before we went to the break. The Swedish man who was released from Guantanamo prison this week says that what is happening, that a lot of the people who are in Guantanamo are there because Pakistanis at the border between Afghanistan and Pakistan captured some of the people fleeing Afghanistan to get away from the military conflict there, captured some of these people, and sold them to the Pakistani authorities, meaning that they turned them in for rewards for terrorists. These people, in turn, were then turned over to the U.S. military, who took them to Guantanamo. There have been no trials, so there is no way to know whether any of these people are really guilty. And it seems almost inconceivable out of the many hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of people who have been sent to Guantanamo that every single one of them is guilty. It means that undoubtedly there are people there who have served a two-year sentence already, who may have been tortured during this time, who have not been guilty of any terrorist acts or belonging to any terrorist organizations or in any way threatening the United States of America in any shape or form, and yet are there suffering. And as long as George Bush and his minions refuse to let these people go to trial 
and let them confront their accusers and let them see the evidence against them, there is no way in the world that these people are going to be freed unless they just happen to be citizens of a country whose president will stand up to George Bush and demand some kind of satisfaction as the Swedish uh, president, the Swedish prime minister. The other thing is that Jerry out in cyberspace has called my attention to an article written by Lonnie Lundy. Lonnie Lundy is the fellow who went to prison for life without hope of parole because of the testimony of the employee who recanted the testimony afterward when he found out that he had been lied to by the prosecutors. And I have put the link to that article on the Radio Links page on my website. I've also put the link to the article about the Swedish man. Now let us go back to the telephones and talk first with Ed in New Orleans. Good evening, Ed. Well, you know, the fact that none of the uh, local news media has apparently picked up in the story kind of shows you what our, what our so-called news media in this country is turning into. I mean, these little clones of Joseph Goebbels you know, are, are about as much on our side as, as the government. Sure. I, I think that the state of this, the press in this country is that it's worse than it's ever been since this country was founded. I really do. I don't think that most people realize how much information the press gets from the government, that all kinds of reports that we get are really nothing more than statements that have been released by government agencies, by inside sources within the government, by leaks and by other uh, means, by which information is transmitted from the government to newspapers and television networks and then transmitted to the people as though these had been independently discovered by reporters and journalists. But a great deal of the information comes from the government. And the journalists are afraid to question that material or to be skeptical about it in print because if they are, they are no longer going to have access to that material. And so even though there is no censorship, per se, in this country, at least not of the newspapers. Uh, the newspapers are strongly beholden to the government. If they want their reporters to be able to attend the presidential press conferences, for instance, uh, they have to be careful what they say. And if they want to print anything about Afghanistan, for example, it's going to have to be something that has been released by the government. It is, thank goodness, through the Internet, that we get to read the reports of foreign correspondents from other countries who have been to Afghanistan and who are reporting directly to us, and or they are doing it through neutral countries, countries that are pretty much neutral in this, like Canada, for example, and we get these stories, and we not only get them, but we get them immediately on the Internet, and if we didn't have that, I doubt that we would have very much information at all. If we didn't have that, we wouldn't have discovered one-tenth of the lies that have been told about the Bush administration, about the war on terror, or the war in, in Iraq. Well, you know, there's another problem, too. One reason why most corruption, government corruption in this country goes unreported is because both parties usually have their fingers in the pot, and since most so-called journalists are in bed with one side or the other, you know, they're not going to report any of it because it's going to implicate, you know, their buddies. That's pretty much along the lines of, of what I was saying. Uh, it's not a good situation, but thank goodness we have the Internet. Again, I'll just repeat that if we didn't have the Internet, we would, I think, be completely in the dark. Ed, thanks so much for your comment. Bye. We're going to take another break, but then we'll have a long segment when we come back. So stay with me, and if you want to join in, 1-800-510-TALK. This is Harry Brown. Welcome back. Harry Brown here, and I got a good email from Bob out in cyberspace who directed me to a website called JibJab. And there is a wonderful animated cartoon on that website about the Bush and Kerry campaigns, <laughs> poking fun at both of them. And I think it's very, very funny. And so I went ahead and put the link on the Radio Links page of my website. Just go again to harrybrown.org and click on links to articles and websites mentioned on the broadcast. And under today's date, you'll see a reference to the animated cartoon, and I think you'll enjoy it. But don't go there until the show's over. Let's talk with Kayleen in Massachusetts. Good evening, Kayleen. Hello, my esteemed Mr. Brown. <laughs> Hello there. Um, I don't really have anything specific to say, but I'm um, just listening to your whole show tonight uh, about lies, 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 the Martha Stewart case, and had um, the government lied, um, they would have paid no consequences. Um, it, it, the government today is just getting very, very depressing. And um, government interfering uh, in uh, same-sex marriage um, is completely ridiculous. Completely ridiculous. Uh, the gentleman who called before, who was a uh, victim of many victim of crimes, uh, it just it's I I love your show and I love listening to you, and um, I have to say it sometimes depresses me. But it's yes, I can I, I can well understand that. It's good because I I hear the truth. I hear the truth. All right. Well, let's tur let's turn it around a little. This week, 
resolved to spend a little less time looking at what's going on in the world, in Iraq or in the United States or in the press, and spend a little bit more time doing something that will enhance your family. Right. And just simply let the rest of the world go by for a good part of this week and focus on some area that you have a lot more control over than you do over the American press, the American government, the American military, and so on. And take advantage of the control that you do have that you haven't lost and do something very, very useful with it. And don't under any circumstances, feel the least bit guilty about it. Because <laughs> you you were not put on this earth to save this earth. You were put on this earth to make your way and do the best you can for yourself and the people that you love. Absolutely. And um, I am libertarian all the way. Uh, I have been for several years. And I this is what sometimes makes me depressed. Is It makes me very angry that the government is the way that it is, that it's so socialist. And, uh, for instance, um, I live in Massachusetts, as you know. Uh, there's now a statewide smoking ban. Uh, which should not be left up to, up to, the, <coughs> to the government, the government sure. uh, but up to individual business owners. Uh, a small example, and it just makes sure. me so angry. Yes, it's and very symbolic of, of what's going on throughout government, uh, mm-hmm. state, local, and federal. Well, when you take that time off this week, realize that there are a lot of people fighting this, that there are a lot of people working on it, and we can get along without you for one week, Kayleen, so do something for yourself, <laughs> and, and we will not think the less of you for it, because I know you're going to come back. And uh, tune in again next week, and I'll try not to depress you so much. No, no, no. You don't depress me. My government depresses me. I know, but I talk about you these lift, things. You lift me up, though. You, because you stand up, and we stand up with you. And I love that. Oh, good. Thanks so much for calling. And thank you. You bet. Good night. Good night. All right, let's uh, travel on out to Oregon now and talk with James. Good evening, James. Oh, uh, good evening, Eric. What's uh, up? Well, first of all, uh, I want to congratulate, on, uh, congratulate you on, on an excellent show. Uh, that stuff about the Federal Reserve, I didn't know any of that, and I'm a well-informed person. So, uh, yeah, so far it's been a great show. Um, also, I want to say um, I agree with Eileen when I when I tune into alternative uh, media like yours and, and some others, I, I get depressed too. Um, and yours your your advice is perfect. I mean, it's it couldn't be better. Um, anyway, so uh, what's on my mind tonight is is you were talking about the pathetic state of um, uh, what do you call mainstream media mm-hmm. these days. Uh, I just bought a book called Manufacturing Consent. It's written by Noam Chomsky, and it, it does go a long way to explaining why the institutional media is the way it is. What, what is the uh, main theme uh, or the main reason that he gives for the state of the press today? Well, basically because um, corpor- the, the corporate media, which is you know 99.99% of the mainstream media today, is pretty much in, in bed with the government. I mean, it's, it's just one big corporation. But it's, it's, it's a little more complicated than that. It's basically uh, um, there's five filters that he mentioned. It's, it's basically institutional analysis of what he calls it. It's, mm-hmm. I find it highly informative. Um, but there are other reasons. The government, for instance, like um, Democracy Now! I don't know if you've ever heard of them. Uh, they're on Free Speech TV. They're a radio program. Mm-hmm. Um, and while I'm on the subject, they are an excellent alternative media source. Uh, they depress the hell out of me. That just gives you a clue. <laughs> uh, and they're on every day, and you learn a great deal uh, from listening to Democracy Now!, which is on the radio and TV, but Free Speech TV, yeah, it's couldn't so, be better. So you give them a rating of five frowns? Is that it? Yeah, yeah, I do. Um, okay. Yeah, they're on uh, Dish Network, but I don't know who else carries them. Um, but anyway, yeah, they, they, um, they just wrote a book, Democracy Now! did, and it's called The Exception to the Rulers, um, and in it, they, they say Clinton once called into their show to say, get out the vote or whatever, and before you knew what was going on, they, had a whole, they asked him a whole bunch of tough questions. Well, the next thing you know, his uh, press people call in and say, okay, we're not talking to you anymore. What you did to Bill Clinton, you know, I mean, <laughs> yeah, they right. do apply pressure to people who ask tough questions. I mean, they do it as a matter of rote. Sure, and the, the pressure is denying them access exactly. to, to the uh, news sources and so mm-hmm. on. Exactly. Um, and so that's what it's all about. It's, it's, it's mostly the government's fault for trying to control the media, and the media you know, have to fall in line or they don't get access. Mm-hmm. Um, but then alternative radio programs like you and or Democracy Now! Um, and or the Internet, like you said, are the saving grace of America today. So the truth is out there. Also, one unrelated item. Sure. Um, I don't know if I should tell you this, but uh, you know, down, Downsize DC has just gotten their uh, online thing together where you can, uh, an action item, uh, you can go onto the Internet, write a letter to your congressman, just two, you know, two, three clicks, something like that. Yes, it's a wonderful system. Yeah, but it's not uh, encrypted. It's not SSL. It's, in other words, when you type in your name and your personal information, mm-hmm. a hacker can read it. I just thought I'd let somebody know. Yeah, you that's, might you might email a, a message to Downsize DC and point that out to them, and maybe yeah, there's something good. that neither of us know about this, or you may have it right on hit on the head, and they need to know about it. Yeah, I should send an email. I thought are, are you're not involved with them anymore. Or? Yes, I am, but uh, you know things that pass through me <laughs> take uh, three times as long as uh, it's, it's the shortest distance to between two points is not ever through Harry Brown. 
Uh, okay. Um, I'll send him an email, but um, you know, I I never get a response. I don't know whether it actually gets to them or not. Oh, I'm sure it does. Jim Babko will read it, and he responds to many many emails that he receives, cool. and even ones that he doesn't agree with. And so I, I'm sure that you will be heard. Oh, well, okay, that's that's it, Harry. Uh, keep the faith. You're doing a wonderful job. Well, thank you. I appreciate that, and keep Excellent. listening and keep calling. Excellent show tonight. Thank you. Bye. Uh, I'm glad that James brought up Downsize DC because they have set up this system whereby you can, on some issue, send a, a, an email almost automatically to your congressman. and You can just put in a line of your own or they'll give you a couple of things to, to mention or whatever it is, but by virtue of your zip code, they will know which congressman it should go to, and they've got the email addresses of all the congressmen, and they send it automatically for you. And I won't try to explain it further, but you can get it by just going to downsizedc.org or downsizedc.com, and I'll put those uh, addresses on the radio links page uh, at the next break, and I think that it's a very, very valuable service. Along the subject of lying, which we've had so much on tonight, Jerry in Iowa says, it's nice to know that our government is locking up liars. When is Bill Clinton, Jerry Ford, Jimmy Carter, and the Bushes going to go to prison for lying? I'm probably prison bound myself because I lied to a teacher in high school. Soon everyone we know will be in prison. Let the war on liars begin. Yeah, I guess you're right, uh, Jerry. I appreciate that. We will, of course, see a further development of this idea of just inventing reasons to prosecute people. Because, as we have discussed so often, prosecutors do not face consequences. Obviously, if a prosecutor got defeated in court over and over and over again, if he kept trying to prosecute people and kept finding the verdicts coming back as not guilty, then he probably would be replaced. But that rarely ever happens. But if a prosecutor is found out to have prosecuted somebody who is proven by DNA evidence or anything else to be innocent, the prosecutor faces no consequences whatsoever. If somebody has spent 20 years in prison falsely for a crime that somebody else committed, the people who put him there will suffer nothing personally. They will not lose their jobs in the government. They will not be fined. They certainly will not go to prison themselves unless there is an enormous scandal in which it is somehow proven that this was done deliberately. But there is no one who is really interested in making such investigations. And as I've said over and over and over again, the difference between us and the people in Washington and the state capitol and city hall, the difference is simply that when you or I do something wrong, intentionally or by accident, we pay for it. Not necessarily by going to jail or by being prosecuted, but we pay for the consequences of our acts. We face the consequences of our acts. But being in government means never having to say you're sorry, never having to face the consequences of your acts. And that is the primary reason that government grows and grows and grows and becomes more and more invasive. Any politician can promote a new government program. He can get his fellows to agree to it by agreeing to their programs. In other words, they swap votes. They say, I'll vote for you pro your program, you vote for my program. And the money's just coming from the taxpayers anyway. And if this program proves to be a disaster, if it makes people homeless, if it makes people lose their jobs, if it makes people ill, if it makes some people die, no one will ever pay any consequences for it, for having voted for that, for having promoted it, for having administered it, for having adjudicated it, for anything. None of these people will pay any consequences whatsoever. And under those circumstances, you are giving them a license to just go and do whatever is politically profitable for them. Are they going to get voted out of office for this? Of course not. The incumbent re-election rate is always well over 90%. It takes an enormous effort to get somebody out of office, and it's not going to be because of his votes in Congress, because 90% of the people who vote in an election will have no idea what the incumbent has voted for. In most cases, the incumbent doesn't even know what he has voted for. He has been told by his party, we want your support on this, and the, vote is, and the bill is to enhance the police forces in this country, and he has no idea what is actually in that bill. A couple of emails before we wrap this up. Uh, Bob asks uh, about your TV show. I believe I've asked this question before, but I don't believe I got a response unless I missed it. What's the plan? Uh, well, you did miss it, I guess, Bob, and I thought you or somebody asked about it once before. I am working with some people right now to try to get a national uh, television show on the air, uh, a one-hour weekly libertarian show on a national cable channel, and it will be easily two months or more before there's any word on whether we have succeeded. We will be shooting a pilot at the end of next month, August, and are developing the script and hiring the people to work on it and so on. And there's nothing that anyone can do to help in the sense of writing to somebody or urging somebody to take it on. We need to get a pilot and then shop that pilot around to networks. We'll start at the top with networks like MSNBC and Fox and so on and work our way down through the entertainment channels. And who knows, maybe we'll wind up on the fishing channel. I don't know. And maybe we won't wind up on any channel whatsoever. But 
I'm very, very glad that we are having this opportunity to give it a try. And if we can get it on television, I think that it will be not only a great addition to the libertarian movement, but it ought to be a lot of fun also because we're trying to make this a very entertaining show in which we'll have a certain amount of comedy, spoofing politicians and government itself, and getting across the main message, which is how much better life could be if we were to get the government out of education, out of health care, out of welfare, out of all of these areas where it's making such a mess and all the things that we could do with the money, with the freedom, with the opportunities. And I, of course, I'm very excited about this project and i just hope it succeeds and when i have some word you will be the first to know about it rob uh, sent a couple of messages tonight with the subject the seven carrier strike force groups and the last one says type this into your browser and you will get many links but unfortunately rob you didn't give me a link to type into my browser so there's nothing i can do about it dave and phoenix is curious what you think about this there have been many occurrences of abuse of the constitution by government during previous periods in american history such as the civil war world war one the great depression and so on there have been many others. But I was wondering how you think the level of abuses happening today compared to these three previous examples. Well, there are some things that happened in the previous examples, like the Civil War and World War One, that were actually worse than what's going on today, such as the people who were locked up in World War One for complaining about the draft. If they were to institute a draft tomorrow morning and I were to speak out against it on the show or in a speech or anywhere else, I doubt that I would be sent to prison for it today as people were sent to prison during World War One. And I don't think that in the near future any state legislature is going to get summarily dismissed by the President of the United States as Abraham Lincoln dismissed the legislature of the state of Maryland and some of those abuses. But generally speaking, of course, things are much worse today than they were 100 years ago or 150 years ago because these things accumulate and very little gets retracted. It just gets added to. Thomas Jefferson said it is the nature of things for government to grow and liberty to give way. And we have talked about many of the reasons for this. Government is force. Government has the guns on its side. And so we have to fight an uphill battle always to get anything from government, and government can very easily take things from us. We've talked about the lack of consequences that politicians face. We've talked about the fact that government has uh, been in a position to buy support from people. There are many, many reasons that liberty gives way and government grows in the nature of things. And so naturally these abuses accumulate and add to each other. Thanks again for being with me this evening. I hope to have the opportunity to talk with you again next Saturday night, so please tune in. This is Harry Brown, and take the advice that I gave to Kayleen. Do something for yourself this week, and don't worry, we'll keep the battle up. Thanks again, and good night.